So I want to talk about something that I've studied for the last 10 years or so, which is the, uh, the extraocular muscles. These are the small muscles that move the eyes. And if you wonder where they are, so sorry, before I start, uh, one of the good things about science is that you get to spend your time with cool people all the time. And I have been blessed uh, with a bunch of collaborators throughout the years. And they are listed here. Uh, these are the topics that I will touch upon uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, I'm not going to go through their names uh, because I'll try to mention them as I, as I go through. As I, well, as I was saying, if you wonder where, where the extraocular muscles are, they are right behind your eyes. So it's something that's right there by my nose. Uh, here they are. This is an MRI uh, of a human head. So the top of the head is pointing towards you. This is the nose. These are the eyeballs. And here in pseudocolor, uh, reddish, those are the extraocular muscles. So each muscle, each eye, sorry, has six extraocular muscles. Unless you are a rat, a mouse, a uh, rabbit, or a cat, and they have an extra muscle. Uh, but we don't have that. So what's, what's interesting about them? Well, we think they're very different. Um, and the reason why we say so is because they have very small fibers. So this is a, a rat diaphragm, and you can see the fiber size, whatever, whatever that is. And then if you look at the eye muscles from the same animal, itty bitty things. Very small compared to that. And that's, that's one of the hallmarks of extractor muscles, very small muscle fibers. They're, they have six different kinds of fiber types compared to only three in limb muscles. They have very small motor units, meaning very few fibers innervated by the same motor axon, where you have tens to hundreds in, uh, in uh, limb skeletal muscles. They generate low forces and high velocities. They have really high mitochondrial content, meaning they are very oxidative, and they will be able to sustain activity for a long time. Makes sense because we're moving our eyes all the time, even when we're sleeping. You think about rapid eye movement sleep, we're moving our eyes. So they're, as I said, active, meaning they're resistant to fatigue. And the last thing that's very important from a clinical perspective, and these muscles are immune to some diseases. They are completely immune to muscular dystrophy, but at the same time, they're targeted by other diseases. For example, they are very affected by uh, myasthenia gravis. Uh, they are affected by some mitochondrial myopathies. Uh, they are affected by some thyroid diseases that affect the eyes as well. Uh, so they're, they're different compared to other muscles. Now, my First question, my background is in, in, in muscle physiology. The, and I actually, when I got my PhD many, many years ago, it was in diaphragm. And diaphragm is a very interesting muscle as well because that's the one that we use for breathing. So when I moved on to, uh, to study the, the uh, extraocular muscles, my first idea was that, well, maybe the extraocular muscles are just an extreme example of, of a very well-trained skeletal muscle since we move the, the muscles of the, the, eye, the uh, eyes all the time, my idea was, well, that's, that's exercise. And that means that the eye muscles are just very well exercised muscles. So what do you get when you, when you exercise muscles, when you endure and strain uh, muscles, meaning you run a lot, uh, that, that kind of uh, activity? So trained muscles have smaller fiber size compared to muscles from sedentary people. Well, OK. But then the extraocular muscles have smallest the smallest fiber size. Trained muscles have general, in general, they have more capillaries than muscles from sedentary people, fine. But then the extraocular muscles have the highest capillarity, even more capillaries per unit of area or any way you want to measure it. Trained muscles usually have more mitochondria, but the, extra, uh, the extraocular muscles have the highest mitochondrial content of mammalian muscles, uh, with some caveats that will not, I will try not to get into. Trained muscles, in general, tend to use more lipids. They will store lipids inside, inside them. Well, eye muscles actually don't have any lipids inside. Trained muscles will tend to accumulate glycogen in order to provide glucose for metabolism and then generate ATP. Well, eye muscles have almost no intracellular glycogen. OK? So it's not quite. The, the phenotype of the extraocular muscles is not quite the phenotype you would expect if it's only very well-trained muscles. It's something else. 
All right, so the first thing I we were looking into was why are they, are they so small? Um, and again, this is a couple of examples. EDL is a limb muscle from, from, um, uh, from the legs of, of, of rats. Uh, and it's actually, it has quite, the fibers are quite big. And you can see that here, big fibers. And then you look at the extracurricular muscles from the same animals, and they're very small. Kind of the same thing I already said before. And one thing we were, we kind of bumped into a few years ago is that the extraocular, extraocular muscles express a protein called myostatin. And myostatin is what we call a negative regulator of muscle size, meaning when you have a lot of it, your muscles are, are very small. So if you have less of it, your muscles will get bigger. And this is a, uh, an example of that. On your left is a mouse, a normal mouse. On the right is a mouse that has myostatin knocked out. Mighty mouse. You can see how that I means bulked up, like the guy has worked out, right? If you peel the skin off, you will see that the muscles are really, really big. Well, we think that the eye muscle is reverse. They have a lot more of this protein instead of less. And that makes, we think, it makes the fibers really small. Now, of course, that story is not without some complications. And it turns out that there's another protein that's also highly expressed in the extraocular muscles, and that's called insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1. Well, IGF-1 is a positive regulator of muscle size, meaning when you have a lot of it, your muscles get bigger. And, and IGF-1 is something that's being used in all people in order to make them reclaim or regain some of their muscles, uh, muscle size. Okay? So we have two competing influences in, this, in, in eye muscles. We have Myostatin, negative regulator of muscle size, way up. And we, we have IGF-1, a positive regulator of muscle size, also way up. But since we know the final result is small fiber size, we think myostatin is winning the battle. And IGF-1 is there to, to do something else. IGF-1 IGF is also known to change the metabolic properties of tissues. And one of the things it's known to do is known to increase aerobic capacity. So we think IGF-1 is one of the many influences that's making the eye muscles have more mitochondria. Right, so I'll be talking about loss of, loss of functions and gains and gain of functions in, in terms of, of eye muscle compared to, other, uh, to skeletal muscles. And one of the things that we know is lost in the extraocular muscles is creatine kinase. Now creatine kinase is a key buffer, key, a key energy buffer in, uh, in muscle systems. And they actually, uh, I, a few years ago, I didn't know this. I, the only thing I knew was that there were two forms, CKM present in uh, striated muscles and CKB present in brain and other tissues. So muscle, skeletal muscle, adult skeletal muscle has the dimer CKMM. So CKM forms dimers and in adult skeletal muscle will be homodimers. Turns out there are two mitochondrial forms Sarcomeric CK, that's present in all striated muscles, meaning skeletal and cardiac muscle, and ubiquitous CK present in all other tissues. And it regulates, a rea a, it controls a reaction where, where you have um, basically ATP and creatinine is converted to ADP and phosphocreatinine. And phosphocreatinine is the way to store energy because the reaction goes both ways. So most of the energy in muscle is present as PCR, and as ATP is consumed and ADP goes up, then the reaction goes this way, and we move that phosphate back to ADP to form ATP. And we can do that in the cytosol where the contractile filaments are, the ones that are using up the, uh, the ATP are, and also in the, uh, the mitochondria in order to move ATP from mitochondria to the cytosol. So creatine kinase overall activity forms a special and temporal buffer for ATP. Well, it turns out the creatine kinase activity is very low in extraocular muscles, only 20% or less of what you find in limb muscles, even though these are very active muscles. Furthermore, if you inhibit CK activity in the extraocular muscles, there's no effect. So this is uh, in isolated extraocular muscles where we use this particular compound, DNFB, to inhibit CK. 
and then we make the muscles contract in vitro. It's a, uh, an in vitro fatigue protocol. And as you can see here, there's no difference between the control muscles, those with the white circles, and the black circles, those are without CK. Okay? In this case, I'm not showing you the, uh, uh, what happens with, with uh, EDL muscles when, when, we have, when we have the same chemical, but believe me, they, those muscles become a lot more fatigable when you, when you block CK activity. All right, now, a gain of function. In muscle physiology, especially in, in exercise physiology, we usually think of lactate production as the end product of anaerobic metabolism. You use glucose all the way to pyruvate, and then you don't have enough mitochondrial capacity to use it up, so it goes out as lactate, lactic acid. And some people even think that that's a cause of fatigue. Well, the reaction that, cat that, that uh, makes um, pyruvate is catalyzed by an enzyme called LDH, lactic uh, dehydrogenase. So pyruvate goes here, and then it gets converted by LDH to lactate, and lactate will leave the muscle cell. And that's what happens in a lot of skeletal muscles with activity. In extraocular muscles, same thing, glucose goes to pyruvate, and then lactate could go out as well, right, it's be, if it's being used a lot. Except that the isoform of LDH that's being expressed in the extraocular muscles allows the reaction to go the other way, from lactate to pyruvate, right? So we have now the ability, we think, of using lactate as a substrate that would go from here to pyruvate and then to Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. And let me show the evidence for this. So this is in isolated muscles in a bath. And this is force as percent of time zero, meaning we're trying to fatigue the muscles. We make them contract repetitively for many, for many minutes. And EDL, after whatever time, will drop force to about 45% of initial force. If you have lactate in the buffer instead of glucose, there's a small effect, but significant effect the muscle becomes a little bit more fatigable. If you act at uh, lactate and a blocker of lactate transport, the effect remains the same. It's about a 10% dec uh, decrease in, in the uh, amount of force produced by the muscle. Now, if you have an extraocular muscle control and it will fatigue less, and then you switch glucose for lactate, so now instead of having glucose in the medium uh, bathing the muscle, you have lactate. The muscle will not fatigue more. So this alone kind of tells you that the muscle is able to use lactate. But now the kick, uh, the proof here is that we block the movement of lactate from the outside of the cells to the inside with this thing, with this, uh, thing called cinemate. And that's when we make the muscle a lot more fatigable. We don't have glucose anymore. We have lactate in the buffer, but we can't use it because it cannot enter the cell, and this muscle becomes more fatigable. I mean, it's kind of telling us that lactate is able to sustain activity in these muscles. Now, there's a problem with this whole, with this whole concept. When we look at, at the activity of the enzyme that allows the muscle to convert lactate to pyruvate, LDH, the activity of this enzyme is actually lower in the, skeletal, in the extraocular muscles, not higher, or at least the same. So we know that the isoform expressed in the extraocular muscle is the one that facilitates the movement from lactate to pyruvate, but we have a small amount of it. But this is telling us that it's sufficient. So what we think is happening is that the LDH, the um, isoform that's allowing this to happen, is localized in compartments within the cell that facilitate the movement of lactate to pyruvate and then to mitochondria. So I think it has to do with how you compartmentalize the enzyme. But that remains to be proven. So this is my initial take on kind of the layout of, of the land for the extraocular muscles. Again, we have very small fiber size. We have high mitochondrial content, low glycogen lipids, low creatine kinase, and they have the ability to use lactate as a substrate. By the way, these are four extraocular muscles, uh, extraocular muscle fibers, 
Uh, you can't see this with the light, but can we dim the light some, somewhere? Uh, the front, or which one? Let the experts do it. All right, so one fiber, and all these things, these darker dots, those are mitochondria. So in technical terms, this is what I call oodles of mitochondria, OK? And you see that most of the fibers have the same thing. Some, some of the mitochondria seem to be kind of underneath the membrane, and some are interspersed in the rest of the, uh, the substance of the, on the fibers. OK. All right, so the consequence of having a very small fiber size is that we are, we are minimizing the diffusion distance. So we have a capillary right here. The distance from the center of the capillary, where we have oxygen, to the center of the fiber is less here than in typical bigger fibers. We maximize aerobic capacity because we have a lot of mitochondria. But then we have no energy stores. One reason for this is that there's no space. Either you have mitochondria and contractile filaments, or you have mitochondria and stores. So there's no way to store energy. So the idea is that the substrate, oops, the substrates are being used as fast as they're, uh, uh, as they're needed. So they're coming through. Uh, as, are, as are used, okay? So, what about this kind of function, high mitochondrial content? And again, this goes back to that, that initial idea that I presented to you that, that these are very well-trained muscles. Uh, that was our first impression. So what we looked for was to see if the same factors that induce higher mitochondrial content in exercised limb muscles were upregulated in resting extracular muscles? Uh, and the answer was no. So these are things that are usually way up in muscles in response to exercise. Calcineurin AB, PGC1 alpha, uh, NRF1, and TFA TFAM uh, go up in muscle in response to exercise in order to increase mitochondrial content. And yet these, are, these factors are low in extracular muscle. Well, we, have th we found three uh, factors that uh, are known to be uh, uh, associated with increased mitochondrial content in other systems, in other muscles. And they were also high in extracellular muscle. So two, uh, another isoform of calcineurin and another subunit of calcineurin uh, in addition to P par gamma. So we're still trying to figure out what, what the, uh, the genetic program is that, that makes the extracellular the muscles have as many mitochondria as they have. But in the meantime, I got into something that, that's closer to, to my heart, uh, which is calcium transients. Um, and the idea was, uh, it has been shown in other muscles, in oxidative muscles, that mitochondria can work as calcium sinks. So basically, there's, there's this channel in the, in the uh, mitochondrial membrane that allows calcium to go in as long as the mitochondria are polarized. And this, cal this uh, channel can be blocked with a compound called ruthenium red, RUR. And it has this, this will influence uh, oxygen consumption, and it's also a way to move calcium from the cytosol when it's, act when it's activating uh, contractile filaments and put it away um, in, inside the mitochondria where it's doing something else. <clears throat> All right, so uh, bear with me for a sec uh, because this is a BC slide. But this shows, if you look at the left panel first, um, it shows the upper panel, uh, upper tracings, these are calcium transients inside the fibers, measured with a fluorescent calcium indicator called INDO1. So the squiggly lines, that's how calcium goes up during a contraction. The bottom shows force in the same muscles, um, just for the, with the force transfer. And the squiggly lines just show the particular force response of, of, of that during that contraction. So in the control muscle, in the control condition, we have the muscle um, doing what we call a submaximal tetanus, or it's a maximal contraction. That's why the line is squiggly here instead of solid. It's a submaximal contraction. So calcium goes up. That activates the contractile filaments. They allow the muscle to shorten and develop force, and you get this. Now, if we depolarize, we depolarize the mitochondria with this particular compound, CCCP, there's no gradient for calcium to move into mitochondria anymore. It's a great way to poison cells as well. 
So we can do this for a very short time. The calcium transient will go up, actually goes up eh, a bit, but force goes up noticeably. So when you look at the change in force and calcium as percent here, as percent of control, both for uh, a limb muscle and for extraocular muscle, a limb muscle with less mitochondria than extraocular muscle, you have that when you um, depolarize mitochondria, there's a small increase in force and calcium for the limb muscle. And there's a much greater increase in force and calcium in the extraocular muscle, right? So the effect of mitochondrial depolarization is more significant in the muscles with the higher mitochondrial content. All right, so what's the consequence of this? The consequence of this in, in um, uh, muscle physiologist jargon, if you will, is that it will increase or extend the frequency response range of the muscles. So when you take muscles, you can take one fiber, one, a single muscle fiber innervated by a motor axon. And the, the, the amount of force that the muscle will, will generate is sigmoidal. It's a sigmoidal uh, uh, function of the frequency at which you stimulate the, 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 uh, the uh, motor axon, meaning it will go up, up to a point, and then will plateau. Right? So if you, if you stimulate the motor axon 1 hertz, it will do one thing. 10 hertz, force goes up. 20 hertz, higher still, until you get to the maximum, which for most limb muscles will be in vitro, our particular system, will be in the range of 150, maybe 200 hertz. And in vivo, we never use muscles at, at those frequencies. In rats, which work at higher frequencies than humans, they use our limb muscles at 30, 40 hertz, uh, if that, when they're walking around running. Whereas the eye muscles go, I mean, at, at 100 hertz, when this rat diaphragm is already maximally activated, you see there's smooth force, force is not going any further. That's as high as it goes. This is halfway up. 30 hertz is when you get maximal force of rat extraocular muscles in vitro. Human eye muscles in vivo, actually monkey, primates, non-human primates. They haven't measured that in humans. Um, so monkey eye muscles in vivo, they will start their contraction at frequencies that go from 5 to 800 hertz. Okay. So that's an order of magnitude or more than what you see in limb muscles. By, moving cal by allowing calcium to go not only to the cytosol, but also to the, uh, to the mitochondria, you allow for finer increases in calcium, and you're able to respond to very high frequencies. OK? So basically, it's an issue of control. It allows for final control for, for uh, force production. All right, and this is where it gets interesting, um, or even more interesting. Um, well, we have high mitochondrial content in the extraocular muscles. And the gold standard for measuring mitochondrial content is to look at the mitochondria. So you do electromicroscopy, <coughs> and you do what we call mitochondrial volume density by uh, serology, which is uh, point counting on EM pictures, something that my students really don't like to do, um, but they get to do anyway. Um, I get to do it with them as well. So, so you're counting the actual organelles. Now it's time consuming, difficult, EM, boring for students. They prefer to be doing something on the bench, I mean, enzymes and stuff like that. So what most people do for mitochondrial, estimation of mitochondrial content, is they look at um, enzymes. So enzymes that are present in the mitochondria will work as indices of mitochondrial content. Citrate synthase, cytochrome C oxidase, and a number of them, right? And that's, what, that's how people, when they, when they look at exercise, the response to exercise, and they do muscle biopsies, they can, they can measure mitochondrial enzymes and say, okay, if activity went up by 20% by 20%, mitochondrial content went up by 
So we assume one-to-one -to -one to correspondence between the enzyme activity and mitochondrial content in terms of, uh, in terms of relative changes. So again, this is a busy slide, and we're going to go left, extreme right, and then center. So the first one is mitochondrial volume density. This is the percent of, of fiber volume, fiber, muscle fiber volume that's occupied by mitochondria. It's only 5% for this particular limb muscle. It's about 15%, three times more for extracular muscle. That's a big duh because we already knew that they have more mitochondria. When you look at capillary density, it's about 1,000 capillaries per square uh, millimeter for the same muscle, EDL. It's three times as high in the extracular muscle. Nice, I means one to one correspondence. So the same, the same relative difference between the two muscles for, for both mitochondrial volume density and capillarity. Now, let's look at this index enzymes for mitochondrial content, citrate synthase and cytochrome C oxidase. Citrate synthase shown by the hatch bars and cytochrome C oxidase by the black bars. We have EDL and extracular muscle. And don't worry about the units, just worry about the relative differences. So EDL has whatever amount of, of citrus synthase, and extraocular muscle has more, but it's twice as, more, as, as much. When you look at cytochrome C oxidase for EDL, it has a certain amount, and the extraocular muscle has twice as much. Not three times, twice. Just double the amount or double the activity, if you will. So we actually waved our hands when we wrote this paper uh, a few years ago kind of, and said that kind of points to some differences in mitochondrial, content, in mitochondrial uh, composition in the extracellular muscles. But that was, that was a couple of years ago. All right, uh, I got, well, so Jorge will, oh, actually Jorge knows some people here. Actually Jorge knows the people who uh, uh, did work with me. This is work that was recently done with, uh, with uh, some collaborators in our spinal cord and brain injury and repair center. I'm sorry, research center, uh, Skoberg, at the University of Kentucky. Um, Sasha Rochewski and his postdoc, Samir Patel. So we, we're now looking at mitochondrial respiration. And this is, this is the inside of, my, of mitochondria. This is where things happen. This is how we produce ATP. So we have a sequence of, of big sub of molecular complexes that move electrons from one component to the other, and then they move hydrogen ions from one uh, compartment to another, and at the end create the gradient to produce ATP. And that's as complicated as my biochemistry gets um, in my mind. Anyway, if you isolate mitochondria, you can actually measure how much oxygen they can consume as you activate different parts of this sequence. And it looks like this. So we have the solid line. This is from another leg muscle, gastrocnemius. The solid line is this uh, for that particular muscle. And as you add substrates, mitochondria will respire. This is oxygen, oxygen. So as the line goes down, that means that there's less oxygen in the chamber, meaning the mitochondria consume the oxygen and turn it to water. So when you add the substrates, that's pyruvate and malate, almost nothing happens because mitochondria are supposed to be coupled. They have to have both the substrate and ADP in order to respire. If there's no ADP, they do, usually don't respire, meaning they titrate oxygen consumption to the need for ATP, and they sense that as a presence of ADP. So when you add the substrates and ADP, then respiration takes, uh, takes off. And don't worry about the rest. This is, this is uh, uh, blockers for different parts of the sequence uh, that will tell us different things about the kinetics, but that's not the point. The point is, is basically here. When you add the substrates and ADP to extraocular muscle, mitochondria, they respire less. The slope of the line is less. Bear in mind, this is normalized for milligrams of protein. So it's not that we added less mitochondria or anything like that. We already took care of that. OK? So um, this is the first time I presented this data uh, in public. Um, now I'm confident enough that I can actually talk about this data and, and, and trust that they are, they are true. Um, 
So this is oxygen consumption in three in, in two different states. And this is this is with the substrates without ADP, and this is with substrates and ADP. So the mitochondria go, are going almost as fast as I can. So we have nanomoles of oxygen consumed per minute per milligram of mitochondrial protein. So state three is about half as high in the eye muscles compared to mitochondria from limb muscles. State four is about 60% less, sorry, 40% less in extraocular muscles compared to hind, uh, mitochondria from hind limb muscles. And what's important here is that the ratio of state three to state four, which we call the respiratory control ratio, is high in all of them, close to 10. So that's telling you that the mitochondria are not, they, they're not breaking up when we, when, in the eye muscles when we isolate them. Uh, they do not become uncoupled. These are very normal, normal looking, normal functioning mitochondria to the extent that they are from eye muscles. It's just that they are able to respire at a lower capacity, if you will. Um, and again, these are really, really recent data uh, as of last week, actually as of yesterday, some of them. Um, and these are first look at what, what's making this mitochondria different. So I said, okay, they're able to use, they're less able to use oxygen along that chain of proteins that I, I showed you before. So what's, what's with that? I mean, is that because the, the uh, mitochondria from the eye muscles are, have less protein or have other things inside them or what? So the first approach is to look at, at the proteins that make up those complexes, the subunits of the complexes of that respiratory transport chain. So we have indices of the content of the different um, uh, complexes, and we can also measure the activity of some of the complexes. And that's what I'm trying to show here. So on your left, they're showing the activity of three of these complexes. Complex one, um, it's um, blanking out. Any DH, any DH oxidase? Yes? OK. Dehydrogenase, thank you. Complex two is SDH. I'm checking with the expert, sorry. Yes, and complex four is cytochrome C oxidase. Um, I, my biochemistry is 20 years old, at least. Anyway, so complex one is the first step in that particular chain of events. And the activity of that complex is only half in mitochondria from extraocular muscles compared to mitochondria from limb muscles. Now, the activity of complex two is not that different. It actually, I think it's different. I forgot the statistics on this one. Uh, but it's not a, a big difference. Right. And then you go to complex four. And again, it's only half as high in the extraocular muscle mitochondria compared to mitochondria from lean muscles. We're missing complex three and five. And these are Western blots from, um, for, for those two complexes, uh, representative Western blots. And it's showing mitochondria from gastrocnemius and eye muscle and another, another two independent samples of each. And complex three is the same throughout. There are no big differences in the content of these proteins uh, between these two muscles. Complex five is only, it's only half as abundant in mitochondria from my muscles compared to mitochondria from lean muscles. So we have a bunch of differences that we had to start to tease out now, looking at the composition of the subunits, of the subunits of the complexes, looking at activities, I mean, what's, what's making them do this? And of course, at the end, we hope, we're hoping that that will tell us the reason why, why, why that's the case. Now, um, this kind of to close as another, this was a, a very cool experiment with some people from, from Emory and Michelle Purdue, a colleague from Case Western, John Stoll, who, who's probably the only one in the States who can look at eye movements in living mice and using a mouse from um, Doug Wallace at uh, UC Irvine. So this is a, a muscle that's lacking, sorry, a mouse that's lacking this particular uh, protein called ANT1. ANT1 is right here. 
is that once that this uh, protein or the translocator that moves ADP from the cytosol to in, uh, inside the mitochondria, and then ATP from the mitochondria to the cytosol. So of course, if these mice don't have this protein, they can do this. This particular isoform is present in skeletal muscle. So that you have a mitochondrial deficit in skeletal muscle, also known as a mitochondrial myopathy. And these mice actually have that. They have low tolerance to exercise. Eventually, they develop cardiomyopathy, and they, they, they're not very happy mice. So we thought that maybe ANT1 knockout was going to, was going to be a good model for, for a kind of uh, a pathology that targets the eye muscles. The, the eye muscles have a tendency to get some myopathies where mitochondria are, are affected, uh, and then you get droopy eyelids, and, and you see double, and, and, and your eyes are not working very well. well the loss of ANT1 actually induces a very mild myopathy in the extraocular muscles. So this is EDL from these mutant mice. This is EDL from control mice. This particular stain is called Gomori strichrome. So it's nice pale blue for normal fibers. Mitochondria show up as, as, as darker dots. So some of the fibers will have a kind of spotted appearance to them. When you have the myopathy, or in this case, when, when the gene is knocked out, a lot of the fibers have clumps of this dark stain, and those represent clumps of, of uh, mitochondria. And we call these things, because the dye goes from dark blue to red, we call them ragged red fibers. Again, a hallmark of mitochondrial myopathies. When you look at eye muscles from these mice, um, well, they already look kind of funky to begin with, because they have, since they have more mitochondria, they, they look more like this. But that's only because they have more mitochondria. And in the mutant, they look a little bit worse, but not that much worse. So they, they're, they have more dots, but not that many more. But again, you started from a very high mitochondrial content. And then, when you look at eye movements in these mice, eye movements, intact mouse. So we're assuming that, we were assuming that they were not going to be able to follow things, or they were going to get tired by looking at the same, at the same uh, whatever John does to them. But they were not going to follow targets. There's no problem. The line, the solid line, represents normal mice for this particular behavior. And the dark uh, black dots represent the uh, mutants. They're not different. So behaviorally, they're completely normal. <laughs> and then when you take these muscles and put them in vitro, these eye muscles from the mutants and the controls, and you put them in vitro, and you try to fatigue them, the control muscles do this. These are the, the white uh, circles. And the mutant eye muscles do exactly the same thing. They don't fatigue more. So we were kind of scratching our heads. We had no idea why. And we had a microarray database in the basement back then. And that's when we realized that we had the answer. Because the eye muscles express ANT2. So we knocked out an ANT1, and they said, peachy, I don't care. I have ANT2. So they were more than capable to compensate for the mutation by expressing a, another isoform. But actually, that came after the fact. We never thought about that one. But it was, matter of fact, it was our first example of an intrinsic difference in the mitochondrial composition of the extraocular muscles. So to close, um, this is what, what, what we, we are looking into this, our final loss of function. <coughs> when we get old uh, and we become even more sedentary than before, our, our muscles, limb muscles, get detrained. So we, our aerobic capacity goes down, mitochondrial content, of course, goes down even more. Now, some muscles don't decrease their activity levels as much with age. Eye muscles, respiratory muscles, and that's, that's basically it. So we were looking at eye muscles. Now, we're thinking the activity of the eye muscles is not going up with age. We're hoping it's staying the same, right? There's no reason for, for it to go up, at least not, not to me, not intuitively. Not, not, it's not an, an intuitive difference to me. So we got eye muscles from, from young and old rats, 
six months and 30 months. Um, um, and it was very striking to see how mitochondrial content went from, from high to even higher. So you see these things here, big clumps of mitochondria right underneath the membrane, all these things here in the muscles from all animals. Okay. Again, the, if, if we were looking at young muscles, I would say mitochondrial myopathy. Since I'm looking at old muscles, I'm saying, I don't know what this is. But it's, but it's interesting. Um, and since I'm getting there, I need to know why. Um, there are some, there's some anecdotal evidence of, of, uh, of loss of, of uh, eye movement capacity, if you will, with age in humans. Um, but it's very spotty, meaning nobody has really, really looked for, for that. Uh, and it has, been, it has been explained as being something with the central processors for, for uh, eye movement control. But nobody has looked at the periphery, at the eye muscles. And now this is the first evidence, uh, in, at least in this model, that there's a basis for a mechanical dysfunction of these muscles that's probably explained by some metabolic arrangement. Why would you have so many mitochondria? We think, and this is our next step for the next six months, we think that these mitochondria are not working very well. We think they become dysfunctional, and that's a trigger that makes the muscles compensate by producing more and more mitochondria. Um, and, and this is just our, our first attempt to look at, at the subunits that make up some of the complexes for this mitochondria. And, and the point here is that they, rea they, they um, respond in different ways. So these are subunits for, for one complex. These are subunits for complex five. And you'll see how they're not behaving the same way. So these subunits go up some from six to 30 months. But this other one goes way up and stays up. So the uh, stoichiometry of, of the complexes should be constant. I mean, co the uh, complex composition should be the same. So either this gene, I mean, it is expressed, but it's not being translated, meaning we don't have the protein, or this is, this is the abnormal response. But this is, this is very preliminary, and I'm not going to speculate more about that. So uh, in conclusion, we have this about the eye muscles. We have lost uh, major metabolic buffers. So we, ha we have no glycogen. Uh, well, I didn't show this, but the enzymes that break, up, break down glycogen uh, are actually downregulated in, in the extracellular muscles. We have less creatinine kinase activity and content, plus we don't need it. I didn't, show about, I didn't talk about this, but there's also less carbonic and hydrous activity as important for the regulation of pH. Um, we've gained some alternative mitochondrial functions, like the use of uh, lactate as a substrate. Uh, we can use mitochondria as fast uh, calcium sink, uh, sinks in the extracellular muscles, and that will extend that frequency response uh, curve that I was telling you about. And there's this growing evidence of intrinsic differences in, in the composition of the mitochondria in the extracellular muscles compared to other muscles. <clears throat> and this is bringing us to that, to that lost, I hesitate to, use, to say lost, but that's kind of, that was the only way I could think about this. Lost, decreased, diminished uh, mitochondrial respiratory capacity in the uh, extracular muscles uh, because it was completely counterintuitive to me. I was expecting the opposite, and yet biology threw me a curve. Um, so then the question becomes whether the high mitochondrial content is to compensate for this, or we need the high mitochondrial content for alternative functions such as that. And at the end, that may be the reason why the eye muscles are uh, particularly susceptible to some mitochondrial defects uh, related with age, like the mitochondrial myopathies I was telling you about. And thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions.